Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome to the Zia Wave Book Club. I um, hope everyone's well and enjoying the summer. Um, today, we are very excited to have comedian Mark Schiff, who is going to be speaking about his book, Why Not? Lessons on Comedy, Courage, and Chutzpah. Um, and the forward is, is by Jerry Seinfeld, whom um, Mark uh, has traveled with and opened with for many years. Um, and uh, without further ado, I'll turn this over to Mark and let him tell you about the book and about himself. And uh, welcome. Welcome to the ZOA Book Club. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. And uh, thank you, everybody. I want to thank Mort, who uh, gave me a call. And uh, we were talking. And then I, I told him about the book. Why not? Lessons on Comedy, Courage, and Chutz. He said, uh, put me in touch with you and said I should come on here. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here. <clears throat> I w in fact, I was just with Jerry. Last week, we were in Hershey, Pennsylvania, <clears throat> and I got to tell you, um, I did not gain any weight, even though it's the chocolate capital of uh, the country. Uh, they offer you chocolate everywhere you go. You check in the hotel, here's some chocolate, there's chocolate in your room, you get on the elevator, there's a thing with chocolate, and every this. the only thing I never understood about Hershey is the factory building is white. It should have been brown, uh, but that's their problem. That has nothing to do with me. Then I went to Piqua uh, with Jerry. We did a show at the uh, Foxwoods in Connecticut. And I've been traveling with him for 25 years, but we'll talk about that. I'm a stand-up comedian. I started in New York City. I, I was born and raised in the Bronx. I lived there with my parents uh, until they moved out, got their own place. They had had it with me. Uh, no, so I lived in the Bronx and so we moved to Forest Hills and I moved into Manhattan. And at uh, 12 years old, I knew that I wanted to be both a comedian and a writer. How does this happen at 12? So my parents took me to a nightclub called the Boulevard Nightclub. 12 years old, they took me to a nightclub. I'm an only child. So they took me everywhere. You know, when you're an only child, you like the whole ball of wax. And uh, I think I threatened to burn the apartment down if they didn't take me. So uh, they, they took me. And uh, that night, at the Boulevard nightclub, there was a singer named Jimmy Roselli, very famous Italian crooner. And opening the show was Rodney Dangerfield, the great comedian, Rodney Dangerfield, who perhaps is the greatest Tonight Show comedian ever lived on the Johnny Carson show. He came out, started telling jokes. And I said, what is this? I'd never seen a comedian before. I said, what's going on here? This is incredible what this guy's doing. And I asked my parents, I said, what is he? And they say, he's a comedian. I said, really? And I saw my parents laughing. Everybody was laughing all over the place. I said, ah, that's what I want to do. I want to be a comedian. <clears throat> and I never looked back. I decided, to, and when you're 12 and you tell your parents, uh, excuse the noise out there, it's, uh, I'm on Pico Boulevard uh, in my office here. When you tell your parents when you're 12, you want to be a, whatever you tell them, they, they don't believe you. You know, one day you want to be a fireman, a doctor, but I'm a comedian. And then I also started writing. I started writing plays when I was 12. I never even saw a play. I sat down one morning and started, actually evening, around three in the morning, started writing a play. My father went to work 5 a.m. He saw me writing. He said, what are you doing? I said, I'm writing a play. He said, go to sleep. You have school in the morning. Go to bed. So that was kind of the support you get when you're young and you want to be a comedian and a writer. People don't understand, but that's what I did. <clears throat> and um, around 77, 1977, I went to a club in New York and uh, attempted to become a comedian. And I never looked back. I've been doing it for over 45 years. I started with Jerry Seinfeld, a guy named Paul Reiser, who was the star of Mad About You in many movies, a guy named Larry Miller, Gilbert Gottfried, the great comedian who passed on about a year and a half ago, Jay Leno. Um, all these people were the people I, I, I came up with. And when we started, there was no place to work. They had the Catskill Mountains, the Jewish Alps. That's where the uh, Jewish comedians started and worked and uh we were young comedians and uh, there were no comedy clubs by the way just a little piece of information in the 1960s and 70s 85 percent of the stand-up comedians were jewish 
It's a big percentage. 85% were Jewish. And I believe, and some other people believe that stand-up comedians legitimize Jews to a great extent in America. How did this happen? Across the country, the middle of the country, people in Iowa, you know, Alabama, all these places who never met a Jew, never saw a Jew. They put on TV, Johnny Carson show, Merv Griffin show, Mike Douglas show, all these shows. And they would see these Jewish people come out telling jokes and they're sitting home laughing their heads off. And they're going, these Jews, I like these people. These are pretty funny people. I like to go see them, meet them. So in a, in a great way, we as comedians, those guys in the 60s opened the doors to some whatever acceptance, a, a big part of the acceptance that we have today. So um, anyway, so how the book came about. Why not lessons on comedy, courage, and chutzpah? About 20 years ago, um, I got a phone call from a guy named Rob Eshman. He was the editor-in-chief of the Jewish Journal. And he said, Mark, you're a funny guy. Uh, would you write something for us? And he, he asked me to write something about something or other. <clears throat> and I thought about it for about three seconds. And I said, uh, why not? Why not? And uh, he said, okay, and I wrote, I wrote something. And then uh, he liked it. And people seemed to like it. And he called me back. He said, listen, would you write something else? And I said, why not? And those two words are the reason the book's here. If I had said, no thanks, this book would not be here today. But since I said, well, it's like when you get married. I do. Those two words change your life. Hopefully for the better. But uh, I'm 33 years married. Went by like 10 minutes underwater. It was really uh, nothing. So uh, I, you know, I said, why not? And uh, I wrote a couple of articles and, and I, I just kept going. And then what happened was he left the paper. And a couple of years later, this guy, David Suisa, who's the editor in chief, called me up and said, Mark, I, want you, I love your work. Can you keep writing some stuff for us? I said, why not? And then, uh, COVID hit, if you remember COVID at all. Um, my work as a stand-up comedian was completely decimated. No live performances, no nothing. And I was locked in. I was on a home confinement, like prison with my wife for two and a half years. I didn't know when I got married, I'd be locked in three rooms with her for two and a half years. It's like a white collar prison. And every room I went into, she was there. I walk in the bedroom. Hi, how are you? Walk in the living room. How'd you get here? Open the refrigerator. She was sitting in there eating yogurt. It was unbelievable. This woman everywhere. And I'm still married to her. Tell you this, I wouldn't want to do it again, though. I would not want to be locked in with her. You know, it. the other day I had this idea for routine. But it, it, it was a, a question. If my wife and I were arrested, and found guilty. And I got the choice between locked in a cell with her for seven years or by myself, what would I choose? I'm not gonna answer that question I would, because uh, she would not be happy about this. Even though I love her, I don't know that I could get seven <laughs> years in a prison cell with her. You know what I'm saying? I couldn't stand with, would you make your bunk already? You know, so anyway, that's, 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 that's aside from everything there. Um, so COVID hit and, uh, no more work. And I had about 40 of these essays that I had written for the Jewish journal. And I thought, you know, Mark, don't waste the next, whatever it is. I thought it might be a couple of months, you know, who knew a couple of weeks. We didn't know it was going to be two and a half years, but I said, why, why not? You might have a book here. And I thought, why not? And I sat down. And I wrote about six hours a day. I just kept writing like, 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 you know, my pants were on fire. It was unbelievable. And I kept writing and writing and writing. And then I, I thought, maybe I got, I have this here. And I, I knew an agent in New York, this guy, Murray Weiss. He tried to produce a play that I wrote unsuccessfully, but he, he did try to produce it. We got it produced in LA, but Murray, I called him. I said, Murray, I think I wrote a book. Would you like to read it? And you know what he said? Why not? <laughs> so I sent him the book. I sent him the pages. And Murray read it. And uh, 
I knew nothing about writing a book. This is what the miracle of this is. I'm now 71 years old. It's 69 years old, 68 and a half. I started writing my first book by myself. You know how hard it is to get published if you're 25 or 30, let alone 68, and you've never written? So anyway, he reads it and he calls me back. He goes, uh, I think you got something here. And with some work, um, I think maybe we can put this together. Would you like to, uh, would you like me to help you with it? You know what I said? Why not? So we worked on it for six months. He sent me notes. I made changes. I did this. And he really mentored me. Really. If you're ever going to write a book, get somebody that really uh, can, can mentor you. Because it's, you, it's very hard to do this on your own. I, especially in my education. Um, and I wrote about it in the book. I pretty much was done with school at fifth grade. I had had it. I couldn't take another day. I would just sit and stare out the window. My teachers actually said to me in fifth grade, Mrs. Goldman, uh, she said, you know, Mark, uh, all I want you to do is sit with your hands folded in front of you. And I'll give you a zero on everything. And I said, why not? And I <laughs> sat there with my hands folded and I failed everything. And uh, the next, it just, I was done. I, I'm pretty much self-educated. I, 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 would, I would cut school and just read novels on my own, or I would go to Lincoln Center to plays and operas. Who, who does this when they're 15? But I did it. Anyway, continue on. Murray uh, put the book together with me. He said, Mark, you know, I think it's time we send this book out to some publishers to see if anybody wants to buy it. Are you okay with that? I don't have to tell you what I said. That's right. Why not? And he sent it out. 37 rejections in a row. Nice rejections. Beautiful emails from people. You know, Mark is a very good writer. It's very funny. It's interesting. It's touching. But he's not what we're looking for. And they put this in emails, you know, we're not looking, we're looking for trans people, we're looking for black authors, gay people, we're not looking for like white 68 year old Jewish people that have never written before, they weren't looking for this. And I appreciate their honesty. Then we got a phone call from Apollo Publishers, and they said they read it, and they liked it. a woman named Julia Abernoff, Abernoff, Abernoff. she's the head of Apollo, and she got the book. She understood what this book was about. And Murray called me and said, they want to have a Zoom meeting with you. You want to take it? Why not? So I took the meeting with uh, Apollo. We talked. They asked me questions why I wrote the book, why I think the book is important. You're pretty powerful questions. And they said, we'll get back to you. Murray called me. About a week and a half later, said, they want to make you a deal. We want to do it? Yes. I need to... I, you know, I, I didn't even have to say why not at this point. Yes, let's do it. They seem like nice people and they are nice people. Beautiful little publishing house in New York, Apollo Publishers. And we worked on the book for months. Some of the essays were, uh, they, 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 they helped me make it more essay. Like, it's unbelievable the help that you can get when you, when you allow yourself to take it in. Here it is. Why not? Lessons on Comedy, Courage, and Chutzpah, a beautiful book. Jerry Seinfeld did the foreword. Bill Maher wrote uh, about me here. Uh, Colin Quinn, Paul Reiser, Kevin Nealon, Jonathan Kellerman, the great novelist who sold millions and millions of books, gave me a plug here. Seinfeld did the foreword. And the book has been out there. And uh, it's doing good. People are real. I got, if you go to Amazon, you'll see I got like 95 star reviews. It's unbelievable for a guy that didn't get out of fifth grade. So book is out there, people enjoying it. I'm still on the road. Um, tell you just a couple of little tidbits about some of the stories here. I, uh, we were talking before everybody came on here about losing weight. I lost 50 pounds about 10, 11 years ago. I lost 50 pounds. I've been able to keep it off. So one of the stories I write in there is about how I kept off 50 pounds. And this is a true part of the story. Um, when you lose weight, Jewish people cannot believe you lost it on their, your own. They believe that they, you're sick. They have no concept that a, a human being can, they, they, would, they would talk to me, go, Mark, are you okay? They called my wife to find out if I was dying. I lost 50 pounds and they would call my wife, is he okay? We saw him the other day. Non-Jewish people look at you and go, you look terrific. Why don't you go play tennis? How are you getting in such good shape? So I was in a supermarket. And this woman sees me and she flinches. She goes, huh. 
and I knew her. And I went over to her. I said, uh, how are you? What's the matter? She goes, oh, my God. Mark, I heard you died. I said, what? She said, I heard you lost all this weight and you died. I said, no, I'm okay. And she looks at me. I swear, she goes, thank God. Because, you know, I love you. I love your family. You're the nicest guy in the world. Thank God you're okay. I said, I'm fine. And then about 10 minutes, I realized she didn't care about me. Why wasn't she at my funeral? Why didn't she come to the shiver? Why didn't she send the card? Nothing. Unbelievable. Tell you a story, Jerry Seinfeld, um, he has all these Porsches. You know, you may have read about it. He has the biggest Porsche collection in the country, practically. It's an incredible collection. <coughs> And he collects Mercedes, old Mercedes and uh, Volkswagens. So we're on the road. We're in Indianapolis one day. And uh, we see this store. It says uh, it's 1960s um, uh, muscle cars. And Jerry goes, let's, let's go in and take a look. So we, every, every town, Jerry and I, every, every town we go to, we take a walk. Three of us, Jerry, me, and the producer of the show. Just last week, Jerry and I walked through Connecticut. We walked through Hershey, Pennsylvania. It was unbelievable. So we, we go into the store and it's filled with the most beautiful, beautiful 1960s muscle cars you've ever seen. And I'm looking around and the owner's talking to Jerry and Jerry comes over and says, hey, Mark, you see anything you like? I said, yeah, man, this is unbelievable. I love these cars. He said, pick one out. I'll buy you anything you want. I said, what? He said, anything you want. Just pick a car. Let me know in a few minutes and uh, we'll, we'll get the car for you. And I looked at, started looking at one car and they're so beautiful, it's hard to decide. I finally landed on this uh, 1967 uh, Le Mans convertible. It was unbelievable. The most beautiful car I'd ever seen. I just imagined myself driving back from Indianapolis to LA in this convertible with like beautiful women running alongside one and jump in with me. So what happened was I looked at the car and then I got out and I stood back. I said, this is the most beautiful car. I love it. And I walked over to Jerry and he said, so uh, which car you want? I said, listen, this was the nicest offer anybody ever really made. I can't do it. I can't take it. I can't, I can't accept it. And he said, okay, let's go to lunch. Didn't even ask me why. He just said, let's go to lunch. You know, when somebody turns down a, you know, a huge gift like that, at least ask him why. He goes, oh. and when I got outside, I looked back at the car and I thought, you made the biggest mistake, Mark. Why didn't you do that? I feel like kicking myself in the rear end. So I called a friend of mine when I got back to the hotel and he said, you listen, Jerry wanted you to have this car because he loved you because he's your friend. And he wanted you, you know, this would have made him happy if you took it. You know, it wasn't just about you. And, and I couldn't do it because it was such a big gift. And I was so, my esteem was not at a level where I could accept gifts like this. And, and he said to me, next time, if Jerry offers you a car, accept it. I said, what are you out of your mind? Who offers two cars? Who offers one car, let alone two? Sure enough, I'm driving with him. We're on our way to the airport and we're in a 1982 Mercedes 300D turbo diesel, the most beautiful. This is one of the nicest cars Mercedes ever made and one of the best cars. And we're driving to the airport. He goes, you know, I, like, I know you like this car. I said, I do. I love it. He goes, you want to buy it? I said, I can't afford it. He changes lanes. He looks at me and goes, all right, I'll give it to you. You want it? And I said, why not? And he said, okay, it's yours. He said, oh, there's only one problem. The radio doesn't work. Do you want me to fix the radio before I give it to you? Or do you want to take it like this and you fix it? And now my esteem was much higher at this point. I said, you fix it. And two weeks later, he delivered to me the most beautiful, this 1967 Mercedes, and uh, it was a 1982 Mercedes, and I've been driving it on and off ever since. So if somebody offers you a car, especially Jerry, take it, because he's happy that I took the car. So those are a few of the, uh, the stories. I, uh, I don't want to take too much time talking about 20 minutes here. Um, like I said, the book is named, called Why Not? Lessons on Comedy, Courage, and Chutzpah. I'm going to show you one thing before we go. I'll tell you one more quick thing. You can see this. There's a picture of Neil Simon, the greatest playwright that ever lived, most successful playwright, a guy named Larry Miller, the star of a play I wrote, and me, it's a little heavier there, before I lost the 50 pounds. And that's in a play that I wrote called The Comic. And it was a two-person play. And Larry Miller was in 
a pl- in my play, he started my play, and he was also in a Neil Simon play on Broadway. And he said to me one night, he goes, you know, I knew, I know Neil Simon. You want me to bring him in to see your play? This was the first play I ever wrote in my life. I said, are you kidding me, Neil Simon? He said, yeah, I'll bring him in. Next day he comes in and he says, I called Neil. He said, he'll come in and see, uh, see the play this week. Sure enough, the audience was sold out. We saved one seat and then he comes about 10 minutes before the play started. They put him in the seat. At the end of the play, everybody gives the play a standing ovation, including Neil Simon. I'm standing there going, what is going on here? This is my first play. Neil Simon is giving my play. Does he really want to stand? Or is he just going along with people? After the play, everyone leaves. Neil's still there. I go over to him. I go, Mr. Simon, thank you. Thank you so much for coming. He goes, my pleasure. This could not have been any funnier. But I have two suggestions for you. He goes, the first one, when your characters are talking, just two people, make sure they're doing something. If you're a young playwright, listen to this. Neil Simon gave me this advice. He goes, my characters get into the most problems when they're not doing anything. Have them eating, drinking, touching, doing something. I said, I got it. Then he said, does he live or die at the end? And I said, I I don't know. I'm not sure. I leave it up to the audience. He goes, no, you cannot leave this up to the audience. You must make the decision yourself. Yes or no. You decide and let them know. You can't let them leave here and make that decision. And I made that decision. And the play got these incredible. He changed the whole thing by giving me this, this insight. So. I tell people I wrote my first play with Neil Simon. Not a bad thing to do. Not a bad thing to do. So anyway, that's uh, that's it for me. I thank you all for listening, wherever you are. And uh, I thank ZOA for having me. I thank Mort for suggesting this. I thank Liz for uh, and uh, Jacqueline for putting this together with Alan. And it, it's it's been a pleasure. And I'm, I'm a fan of ZOA. I'm a fan of Mort's. And you guys are doing great work and continue on. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's so fascinating to hear about, about how the book came to be. Um, I love the book, by the way. I really loved it. It's it's very, very funny and also poignant in places and in places that make, <laughs> make you almost cry. And, you know, and one, one of the funny things I thought about, you know, about it is that even the footnotes, almost every single footnote has a joke. Like, um, I, I'll give you an example. Um, uh, uh, Mark uses the word machaya um, in one place, and then uh, he drops a footnote as to what it means. And he says, machaya refers to pleasure and enjoyment, a real joy. When the dentist pulls out an abscess tooth, that's a real machaya. When the dentist pulls out the wrong tooth, that's a lawsuit, which is also a machaya. Right. <laughs> right. So let me tell you how that came about very quickly. My uh, agent, Murray Weiss, I had all these Yiddish words and I had the definitions. He goes, you're a comedian, right? Funny definitions too. It was his idea. Uh And I just sat down and I wrote a punchline to every, I I gave the the true, the real meaning of the words. And then I wrote a a joke for each one. So I I credit Murray Weiss for that. Yeah, but that, that was funny. The jokes are really funny and throughout. I mean, it's it's really a wonderful book. I, I just loved it. And it's, it's uplifting too. Um, you know, it really has some wonderful messages about also that Jewish community about what Jewish community meant to you in terms of, um, you know, sort of this ex- existential loneliness that people feel and how the Jewish community is such a solution to that. And, you know, I know that's been the case in the book club. And one of, one of the nicest emails that I got, um, you know, after we started the book club was from somebody who said, you know, in, in this, this isolation of COVID, the book club is really something which, you know, gave her community and, you know, chances to, you know, to interact with the chat and talk to people. And, you know, that's what we try to do here also. So, you know, thank you so much for that message, that wonderful message. Anyway, I'm going to ask, so, you know, please everybody. Um, oh, did you want to say something? Well, yeah, you mentioned Jewish community. I've always lived, I live in Pico Robertson here, which is a very strong uh, religious Jewish community. I lived on, uh, in New York, uh, in the Bronx, very strong, in Forest Hills. I've only really lived in Jewish neighborhoods, except once in San Antonio. Um, we lived near the shul, but it was not a Jewish neighborhood, but the people could not have been nice to me as a Jew, too. Like, uh, I'm, I'm, when I'm walking to shul, all these non-Jews would see me walking, all dressed up, and they go, hey, good Sabbath to you. So, um, but living amongst Jews, I feel most comfortable, most comfortable. 
Very nice. Um, yeah, we have some great questions in the chat, which I'll read. And also, if you want to ask your question live to Mark, you know, please raise your hand. And um, I'll, I'll start with, um, let's see. Um, okay. Oh, here's one from Sherry uh, Bolliker. Um, how did you meet Jerry and what has sustained your friendship? Great question. So in 1977, it was just a dream to become a comedian. And I went and started going to the showcase clubs in New York where you get on, you work for free. If they let you grace their stage, you work for free. Jerry was also just starting out. We met when we first started out together. Jerry was working in Bruinberger as a waiter and selling jewelry on the street. But we spent every night for the first five years together at the clubs. I would see him at one club or another club and we became friends. And um, there's something about, you know, Jerry's arguably one of the most successful comedians ever lived, but early friendships where you build a bond and trust um, are so important. And one of the reasons that I travel with Jerry is A, he, he thinks I'm funny and B, he trusts me. And he knows that I would never, in fact, it's interesting you said that. I'm gonna just tell you in his, uh, writing the introduction to the book is, is uh, forward. This is what he writes very quickly. Mark has been the greatest comedy pal a guy could ever wish for. And I can't imagine taking the journey of comedy life without him. Most of all, he is a great storyteller and he goes on and on about it. But th that that's that when he wrote that, I started crying. That Jerry Seinfeld, one of the greatest comedians ever lived, who I respect, uh, thinks that, you know, I'm in his league there. So, you know, we trust each other. We love each other. We spend time and we, and we talk deep. We never talk sports, which he loves. We talk about marriage, raising kids and work on new routines together. So that's kind of, I hope I answered your question. Oh, thank you. Yes, I, I will. We, we think and more thinks that you're one of the greatest comedians that ever that you are one of the greatest comedians that ever lived and i, I think so too after reading your book and getting to know you a little bit Thank um, you. uh let's see oh okay so alan doberman is asking what hotels did you perform in in the catskills doberman is one of the uh my favorite characters was he in uh uh mikhail's navy alan i tell you that there was one of the characters in doberman <laughs> in Dale's uh, neighboring. So um, didn't really perform much in the Catskill Mountains. I did a couple of nights. We didn't want to go to the Catskill. I respected those guys. And in fact, I just had breakfast two weeks ago on Monday night, Monday morning with Shecky Green, who's 97, and with uh, Pete Barbuti, who's 90. I'm working with Pete next year. I said, Pete, I'm working with you next year. He goes, if I'm alive, I'll be there. <laughs> That's what he said. So. We didn't do the Catskill Mountains because it was kind of a considered uh, an older style. We were young comedians trying to break into our own world. But I did do, uh, what did I do there? I did the Fountain, not the Fountain Blue, that's in Florida. I did a couple of places up there. I, I went to camp up in the Catskill Mountains. I went to Jewish sleepaway camp, Tagola and Monticello. So I did that, but uh, we didn't really work up there. We didn't want to get labeled as mountain comedians. But nobody's funnier than those guys. Freddie Roman, uh, Mousy Lawrence, you know, who's funnier than Don Rickles, who played there, and Jerry Lewis at the Browns. It's an amazing place. So. Great. Okay, then Sher um, Sherry Bolliker also asks, what was it about school that you hated? Were you bored? Yeah, I was probably uh, one of those uh, OCD guys, or not OCD, uh, what, what, you know, uh, What's it when you can't focus? I can't remember. You see, I can't even focus on what it was. <clears throat> yeah. So um, I hated school. I was bored. I couldn't pay attention. Um, my home life as a child was very stressful. I write about it in the book. Um, my mother had, wasn't diagnosed, but was bipolar, probably. They called it high strung then. So I would leave and go to school all stressed out and I couldn't pay attention. I, I, I wouldn't do the homework. And I found the teachers incredibly boring. I, they, they couldn't deliver. You know, 
being a, wanting to be a stand-up comedian, you know, stand-up comedians are some of the most interesting people. They're always like alert and on and focused about what they're doing. And I didn't find that in school. Also, I was very insecure about myself, low self-esteem, which I talked about earlier. And uh, when I was growing up, they would rub it in. They would have Valentine's Day. Remember Valentine's Day? And they would hand out cards like, you know, to you know, all the kids would be told to write cards. I never got any. You know, and uh, it was it was very annoying. Uh, so I didn't feel anybody loved me. So I said, to hell with it. I'm not going to school anymore. And I basically dropped out. I dropped out of high school. I took the high school equivalency test. I don't know how I passed it. And then I uh, just started reading and writing and uh, educating myself. So. Interesting. Fascinating. Um, let's see. Oh, this is from Mark Nagurka. I um, hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Has wokeism impacted your humor or jokes? The jokes you tell has anti-Israel sentiment, sadly, even in the Jewish community impacted your humor? I guess it's too also a good question. <clears throat> no, it has not. Um, I do family stuff. You know, Jerry and I have talked about it. We haven't changed. Uh, you know, we're, we're aware of certain things that, you know, maybe we don't say a little bit, but for the most part, no. Comedy now, you know, th these woke people are so loud about what they're doing, and there's not that many of them. Comedy now is bigger than it's ever been. More comedians are selling large arenas and, and theaters than ever before in history. So people are not paying attention to this. Um, but, you know, uh, you do have to be aware. Uh, but no, it has not affected me, has not affected Jerry. Uh, we don't we don't we don't do politics. Uh, you know, I never talk politics on stage. And uh, it hasn't really affected me in the, in the Jewish world. I talk a lot about marriage and I was waiting to get slapped in the head by some people who said I was, uh, uh, you know, like he, comedians are famous for doing wife routines and women comics were famous for doing husband routines. Phyllis Stiller, who talking about her husband, Fang, you know, Joan Rivers talking about, you know, Don Rickles talking about his wife. So we do that, but nobody's ever stepped up and said that I was, uh, uh, they didn't like what I was doing. So I'm not too concerned about these woke people. I don't post online stuff because they're there. You're really outnumbered. No, they'll, they'll just gang up on you like crazy. So. Um, do you have a favorite essay from your book? That's a good question. That's a good question. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, I've got a few. I've I, I've got a few. I think uh, I can't really tell it now, but one that uh, my wife. It's not so funny, but there's some funny stuff in it. My wife was. Uh, she did a uh, a test. They you know they test your genetics, and she found out she had. Uh, BRCA2 gene and uh, didn't have cancer, but she went through complete, you know, the uterus and, and breasts and, you know, like the Angela Jolie thing and uh, reduced her chances from cancer from 70% down to 1%. Pretty amazing. And that story that, that is in there um, that my wife gave me permission to put this out because we thought it would be helpful to people, to women who might find out about this. So that's one of my favorite stories. Uh, it's both funny and uh, we're glad to have her still here. So I got a chance to write about that. Uh, the story about this guy named Roy Roberts, who's an actor, who's one of my favorites, um, who gave me a Christmas present when I was nine years old. And I didn't know that Jewish boys can accept Christmas presents from people. I asked my parents, can I take this? They said, absolutely. So that story is, those two are some of my favorites. And the story about Catherine Hepburn, the great late Catherine Hepburn befriended me. She, I met with her every, she was, uh, she was in a play called The Matter of Gravity. And I got there early every day and met with Catherine Hepburn for five to 10 minutes a day. And she told me stories about Humphrey Bogart, James Cagney, inviting me to her house to parties. I was, I was making $7.50 a show working at a Broadway theater at Catherine Hepburn supported what I was doing, she became my friend. So that story is, is, is quite amazing, if I do say so myself. 
which I don't like to say, but you asked. That is, that is. Could could you tell the Roy Roberts story? That was also one of my favorites. I had tears in my eyes when I when I after reading that one. That was that was wonderful. So yeah, thanks. So Roy Roberts, uh, he was on a show called uh, Oh Susanna, and it was with this woman named Gail Storm, and it was in the, uh, the let me see fifty six by sixty nineteen sixty or so, and uh, he was the captain of this uh, cruise ship. And I used to watch the show religiously and I loved it. And my parents, we moved to California. And one night, one morning, I'm in a Ralph supermarket with my mother and I see this guy and I start yelling, there's Captain Huxley. Mom, there's Captain Huxley. And I go over to him, I go, Captain Huxley? And he goes, yeah, how are you, son? I'm nine years old. He was like uh, 60. And I, he goes, how are you? I go, can I have a picture of you, a signed autograph picture? And he said, I don't carry him to the to the supermarket with me. He was very kind. He goes, but if you give me your name and address, I'll mail you one. I said, great. My mother's over there. And she goes, we give him the name and address and we leave. And I said to my mother, is he going to mail me one? Because I had problems believing adults. I had been lied to by adults in the past. So when he told me he was going to mail me the picture, I wasn't so sure. She said, yeah, I think you, he will. That night, there's a knock on our apartment door. I go, who is it? He goes, it's Captain Huxley. I said, who? Captain Huxley. I start screaming, ma, it's Captain Huxley. I'm in my underwear, by the way. I'm in my little shorts. I'm nine years old. I open the door and there he is standing there with a package. And he goes, son, you know, this is Christmas week. And uh, I didn't want to mail it to you because I was afraid it might take a week or two for you to get it. So I, I framed this and here you go. And I opened it up. And it was a framed picture of him in the captain's outfit from the show autographed to me, Merry Christmas, all the best, Captain Huxley. And I had that up in my house for over 50 years. People come over to my house, they go, is that your uncle or grandfather? Is he a captain of a ship? This man changed my life. By being kind like that, it made me understand that there was kindness in the world. I didn't actually understand that until he showed up with this picture out of nowhere. So what can I say? I'm incredibly indebted to him. And I tried to find his family years, many years later to tell them what this kind deed was he did for me. And I never was able to find them. Um, it was, they're not in Facebook, nowhere. But he was also, by the way, in, um, he was in, uh, whatchamacallit, uh, with uh, Clark Gable. Why am I forgetting the biggest movie they ever made uh, with Clark Gable? Gone with the Wind? Yeah, Gone with the Wind. He was in that too. It was unbelievable. So uh, that's that's the story. And I'm, I'm, I'm forever touched and, and moved and appreciate too. You can be grateful to people long after they're dead for many things. Yeah, that was, that's such a beautiful story. Um, <clears throat> Ruth Schaefer asks, um, do you get more satisfaction from performing or from writing? Although I guess they're intertwined because you you know write before you perform. <laughs> right. Before I wrote this book, I, I've been writing for 40 years, my stand-up. Um, th that's a great question, too. Those are different types of satisfaction. Uh, one, being a stand-up comedian, you write it, and I can go that night and, and, and deliver it to an audience and know if I have something or not. That, that, that's an amazing sense of satisfaction. When you write plays, movies, TV shows, books, you don't know what, what they're going to think of it for a long time. But on the other hand, I feel less pressure writing this type of thing than I do stand-up. I've, I've, I write about it in the book. I have stage fright. I've had it for my entire career. So I don't always have it, but I've had monster bouts with it where one time I almost thought I was going to fall off the stage. I couldn't swallow. I thought I was going to collapse. It was absolutely horrific, but I keep doing it because I don't want a real job. So um, it's two different types of writing, but they're both incredibly uh, satisfying. Like yesterday, I started working on the story about a walk I took with my son and there was a line or two I wrote in there. And I thought, wow, this, you know, where did this come from? So I'm, 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 constantly amazed when I write something decent. It's never not a machaya. So anyway, thank you for asking. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, one, one of the other stories I really enjoyed was the um, smell my new car. I'm wondering if you could tell that one. 
<laughs> well, the short version of that was, um, I think, <clears throat> that was what my father, um, yeah, I, I'm trying to remember. Is that where I couldn't go near the Cadillac and stuff like that? Oh, when he was telling everybody to smell his new car and the car. Yeah, yeah. Well, my father, my father didn't get his first new. My father was born in 1928. Didn't get a new car until 1967. We had all hand-me-down cars before that. My uncle gave him a car, and then they gave it to me, and then another car. And in 1967, he actually got a car, bought a car, a 1967, a Dodge Swinger, it was called. The beautiful little car with air conditioning. Can you imagine that? We used to have, a, it was like, a, you know, New York summers driving around with my parents smoking in the car <laughs> and with the windows open, 104 degrees out. I used to sneak cigarettes when I was a kid. I would sit when my parents would light up in the front of the car. <laughs> I would light a cigarette in the back of the car and they never knew I was smoking because they were smoking up front there. I was such a sneak. It's amazing I'm not in prison. <laughs> um, but my father would, uh, everybody he saw, he would go, smell this, stick your head in here. I think he got, got pulled over by a cop. And uh, the cop was talking to him. He said, come here, smell this, smell the inside of this car. It's brand new. He was so proud of it. And that's kind of what I think you're alluding to. <laughs> it, also reminded me, it also reminded me of my dad's car. <laughs> sure. I, mean, I think a lot, a lot of the stories people can just relate to, you know, with things in their own life. And I think that's one of the things that, that's so enjoyable about the book. So what you said there is the only way that people can laugh at things is if they relate to what you're talking about. If they don't relate, then um, there's no way to get them to live. Two things have to happen with, for a comedian. They have to trust you when you come out on stage. They have to go, oh, this guy, I uh, you know, feel okay with him. And two, they have to, aha, I know what he's talking about. You know, when, when a good comedian is on, you see people not only laughing, they're shaking their head up and down, acknowledging that they understand. They don't know they're shaking their head like that, but uh, they are, they're shaking their head. Sometimes in some of my routines, they start talking. They lean over to each other and go, you remember when mom said that? You remember when dad said it? And they start, it sounds like they're, they're, you know, but they're a lot of times they're talking about because they, they, they get it. It's a beautiful feeling. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, another thing that I loved about the book is, you know, just talking about the importance of family, you know, as well as the community, you know, just, you know, the love for children and love for parents, you know, even if, even difficult parents, you know, which you, you had mentioned, you know, about yours and, you know, that there was still a lot, very, a lot of love underneath. And um, I think that's one of the very uplifting um, aspects of the book too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you for saying that. Community is, is a big mm -hmm. thing. I didn't really have that growing up. We never had Shabbat meals. I was an only child. My parents would go to sleep at nine o'clock at night. I'd be sitting in my room by myself. So it was kind of a very lonely existence. Um, and there was, uh, we had stress and problems. My mother, like I said, had, had, had issues and, uh, but I gained something later on in life, which if you've had issues, I hope this works for you. I gained something called empathy, which kids don't really have. They don't really understand this. And it sometimes it, it, it takes a long time. Um, but I gained a great deal of empathy for my parents where they came out of 1928, they were born. So their parents were born in the 1800s. So that was the psychology that they learned. People who were in the 1880s and 1890s and stuff like that. Um, but I worked very hard on uh, not staying angry at people, not having resentments. Like I said, you know, I stopped drinking. It's 38 years I haven't had a drink, but things that drive people back to drinking who have stopped are resentments. They're incredibly corrosive. Anger will drive people back. So you have to kind of, anger is the dubious luxury of other people, not people that had addiction problems. Because people with addiction problems, drink and eat, sex, you know, whatever your thing is, they, they, they do it over those painful things. So you have to rid yourself of them as best as possible. So that's kind of what I talk about in the book too, um, getting over the stuff. And uh, I don't do it by myself. I do it with the help of uh, God, who I'm a strong believer in. I believe in God my entire life since I was born. I've never wavered. And I, uh, I have male friends that I talk to, deep conversations with. Um, and we help each other. 
so it's very rare for a guy to have other guys to talk to. It's 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 not generally people guys don't do it. But I suggest that you get yourself some male friends and 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 that you trust and uh, unload. Talk to them. You may not even need a psychiatrist if you do that. Wonderful advice. Wonderful, wonderful advice. Um, yeah, I just want. I also wanted to mention that we have two um, upcoming book clubs um, coming. Um, let's see. Uh, next week, um, we have Charles Jacobs and Avi Goldwasser speaking about their book, Betrayal, the Failure of American Jewish Leadership. That's going to be on the 18th, Tuesday, the 18th at one o'clock. Um, and Jackie, I'm wondering, I'm wondering if you can put the uh, links to the upcoming book clubs in, in the chat for people. And also we have on um, August 2nd, Wednesday, August 2nd, Jamie Glazov from the Glazov okay. Gang. Oh, dear. Um, and that's, um, oops, that's going on. And he's speaking about his book, Obama's True Legacy, How He Transformed America. <laughs> um, also, I, I did want to mention the Charles Jacobs book has a chapter in it uh, by Mort Klein entitled, Our Greatest Weapon is Exposing the Truth. So why do Jewish leaderships fail to do so? Um, so and that's, so it should be really fascinating. Both of those should be really fascinating. And um, I believe we have, Another upcoming uh, book club in September, Alan. If you wanted to mention that, is, is Alan still here? Alan, I see him. Yeah, I just needed to unmute Liz. Yeah, unmute and it. we're going to have. It will be scheduling for September a book club with Naomi Linder Khan from Rigavim, talking about a book that the group wrote called Bedwistan, which is about the uh, Bedouin nomads that are overtaking um, the Negev desert, and mm -hmm. that also will be a fascinating. Please don't miss that. I'll we'll post the date when we schedule. Uh huh. Um, oh, Jackie, can you put the links in also so people can sign up? Um, and uh, Liz, they're already in the chat. Oh, they're in. They're in the. Oh, great. Okay, yeah, they didn't. They just didn't pop up on my chat yet. Okay, and I wanted to um, see. I think I I covered all the questions that people have been um, putting into the chat. Um, and if anybody else has one, I think maybe we have time for one last question. So put it in right away. <laughs> um, By the way, you see behind me uh, all those records, record albums. Can you see yes. That? So I have six. I have a, a, a I have six hundred comedy albums. Wow. Yeah, it's an incredible comedy uh, collection. So uh, I've been collecting those for years. Anything by Danny Kay? Danny Kay. Um, I don't think I have Danny Kay. You know, he he kind of did the songs, and I mean, he the uh, he was amazing. He, he was, was amazing. If you don't know Danny Kay, watch some of those movies. Mm. Oh my God, was he unbelievable? The mm. vessel in the vessel. <laughs> oh, we, oh, we we have um, you know people put in the chat. Thank you so good. They really enjoyed your presentation. People are really enjoying your presentation. And one last question, and then if you'd like to sum up with any um, uh, any thoughts you have. Oh, let me also just mention uh, another announcement is that we have the date for ZOA's annual dinner, which is December 3rd. So everybody save the date. We hope to see you there. Um, okay, and the last- does, does, does ZOA only have dinner once a year? It sounds like- <laughs> Your annual dinner. Otherwise, you guys don't eat all year. Yeah, we don't. We, we, we're uh, saving up our appetites for that. Right. Unbelievable. That must be some. I I, I got to watch you eat that day. <laughs> <Something. Yeah. laughs> okay. And um, we, you know, a lot of we're getting a lot of comments that people really enjoyed enjoyed this. And um, the last question for you is: Did you? Uh, oh, what is your favorite Jewish joke? My favorite Jewish joke. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> So, put me on the spot, will you? <laughs> so this guy calls his rabbi and he says, uh, Rabbi, uh, I think my wife's trying to poison me. The rabbi goes, what? He goes, yeah, I think my wife's trying to poison me. The rabbi goes, what would you like me to do? He goes, talk to her. Give her a call, talk to her, meet with her, you know, find out what's going on. So the next day, the rabbi calls the guy and says, uh, I spoke to your wife. She came in, I spoke to her for five hours. And the guy says, five hours? What do you think? The rabbi says, take the poison. <laughs> you want one more? <laughs> sure. <laughs> okay. So um, this rabbi, priest, and a minister, they're all meeting, and they're trying to decide who's the best at what they do. Who's the best? And they decide separately this week 
They're going to go into the woods. They're going to find a bear and try to convert the bear. And whoever does the best is the best at what they do. A week later, they get back together. They look at the priest. They go, so how did it go? The priest goes, it was unbelievable. I went into the woods. I found this bear. I read there from the, the, the Holy Bible. I gave him one of my sermons. Sunday morning, front row of the church. Then they look at the Baptist minister. They go, how did it go for you? He goes, same thing. It was unbelievable. I found this bear. I gave him one of my talks. I hugged him. I took him to the water. I baptized him. Sunday morning, front row of the church. Then they look at the rabbi. He's in a body cast, a body cast from head to toe. They said, what happened? He goes, I shouldn't have started with circumcision. <laughs> Isn't that a great joke? That's a great joke. That's Very funny. Joke. That's great. And um, do you have any closing remarks for us? I'll let you, I'll let you do the close. <laughs> yeah. So this has been great. I, Liz, thank you. Jacqueline, Alan, okay. Mort, wherever you are in the world doing good work. Um, one of the main reasons I wrote this book was to leave an imprint for my family. I wasn't going to necessarily write a book, but my kids, if you got kids, you know, this is probably true for a lot of you. They, they, they don't show much interest in your previous life. You know, you can tell them a story here or there, but they're busy moving on. But I, I wrote this for my family. It, it ended up getting published and people were enjoying it, but that wasn't the initial intention uh, to put this whole thing together. That was a big reason was for my family to get to know me. And I, I think that if you're not going to write a book, make videos of yourself. Talk about your life on video and put it away. And then give it to your family uh, when the day comes and you're called. Uh, it will mean an awful lot to them. Because I wish I had an hour talk for my father or my mother or for my grandparents. I don't have any of that stuff. But you have an opportunity to do it. So if you don't want to write a book, make some videos. That's that's what I learned here. That's great advice. And thank you again. We really I love the book. I loved your presentation today. We all did. And, and thank you, everybody. I uh, hope to see you next week and uh, great to see everyone. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Liz. All the best. All the best, everyone.